Hi, I'm Jean Boone from the Central Branch of the Howard County Library System. Welcome to Coding with Bricks. What is this class about? Well, it's a chance for us to have some fun learning some computer coding skills without using a computer. I mean, of course, you're going to be watching this on a computer or a phone, I guess, but I'm going to share with you some things you can do at home off the grid, just using Legos or other colored bricks or blocks. And when you do them, you'll be thinking like a computer programmer. Just a reminder that this is a pre-recorded class, so you can pause any time to do, an act, do the activities or go back and review something that you missed. And if you have Lego blocks or some other kind of colored bricks at home, you could get them now and use them to do activities as we go along, or you can just watch and get some ideas and try them out at home later. So what is coding? Coding is the way that people talk to computers and tell computers what they want them to do and how to do a task. If you've played a video game, you've benefited from the work of some computer programmers who had to figure out how to tell the computer how to do every single thing that, um, that the game does and make the whole thing work. So just as people around the world speak different languages, there are different computer languages too. Some are very simple and some are more complex. Python and Java are the names of a couple of computer languages that are common. Maybe you've heard those names before. So when do you think computer code was invented? Hmm. 10 years ago? 50 years ago? You might be surprised, you might be very surprised to learn that the first computer programmer was a 28 year old woman who lived in the mid 1800s. That's right, 175 years ago is when Ada Byron Lovelace wrote what is considered to be the first computer program. Now, it's true that computers hadn't been invented yet but she was working with a man named Charles Babbage who was trying to create something they called the analytical machine or thinking machine. And this machine was designed but never was built in a way that worked. Still, Ada was the one who wrote all the detailed instructions that would have guided the machine's computations and activities so many of her ideas are used today in the way we talk to computers. In fact, the Department of Defense has honored her work by naming a new computer language, Ada, after her. You can read about her in some great books from the library. Let me just show you some of them. Here she is, Ada Byron Lovelace Lace and the Thinking Machine, and as you can see, the thinking machine doesn't look quite like the computers we have today, but it was a machine for making calculations very quickly. There are other books about her as well. This one, Ada Lovelace, is a little bit shorter, or Ada Lovelace, Poet of Science, is one I really like. These are all books you can put on hold and get from the library now. Um, and you might want to learn about some other amazing women who have contributed to the development of computer coding. For example, Grace Hopper, queen of computer code, she worked for the US Navy and she was the first one to discover a computer bug, which was in fact literally a bug, an insect stuck inside the computer and making it go haywire. So if you would like to learn more about that, go look for Grace Hopper, queen of computer code, or how about Margaret and the Moon, about Margaret Hamilton, whose work with computers supported the space program. All right, so now that I've given you that pitch for some great library books to check out, let's see about some fun activities that we can do to help us think like computer programmers. Have you ever tried to figure out a secret code? Computer code is sort of like 
some secret codes because it uses symbols to represent a word or an action. Computers might use number camp combinations to stand for words or commands, like this, this slide that's showing you binary code, which uses just different arrangements of zeros and ones to stand for different commands. Now, today, I've used Lego combinations to represent words. So we're going to make a Lego code that's sort of like um, a computer code. Here's the decoding key or the dictionary for my new Lego language. This is a very basic language. It only has 12 words, as you can see. So, but the thing to notice is that each word has a very unique and distinct Lego pattern that goes with it. So for people, you see you have to have a small orange block with three dots, and it has to sit to the top and right of a gray block that has 12 dots arranged in two rows. If you put a different size gray block there, it would be wrong. It would not, it would not match the proper code. So it's important to pay attention to the color, the size, and the arrangement of each symbol, each Lego symbol, if your code is going to work. All right, would you like to decode a message? Let's see how you do. Here's the first one. And I've got the key right here so you can see it while you're looking at this. What do you think my little four word message says? If you want to pause the recording for a second and think about it, go ahead. But I'm going to put up the answer now. You ready? The first one is you can solve problems. Of course you can. You just solved that one, right? Good work. Want to try another one? Let's do it again. Here's a different sentence using that same set of words. You want to take a minute to figure it out? This one says, people called her Amazing. That's a quote from one of those books. Do you think it was Ada Lovelace or Grace Hopper or Margaret Hamilton that they called amazing? Could have been any one of the three. Okay, so now you see how it works. You use a substitute, a particular symbol, in this case with Legos, to represent a word, and then you're spelling out a message in a secret code that only somebody who has the deep, has the key to the code can figure out. So maybe you can have fun sending some messages back and forth with family members or friends. Are you ready to try writing one yourself? Here's another Lego code key. This time I made 16 words, so you have a few more choices. But again, you have to pay close attention to what is the size and the color and the arrangement of each, each word's code to get it exactly right. It's really important in computer coding that um, you are very precise and careful and don't leave anything out. And that's what these Lego symbols help us think about, being very careful and making sure it matches absolutely exactly. Okay, so your chance to write a message. You can write, books can take you anywhere. And if you have Legos with you right now and you wanna try that, you could do it now. You can also just uh, draw, the, draw pictures of the code as long as you, you, know, you would color it in and make sure it had the same number, right number of dots. And then it would represent what, um, what we can see on the screen here. So go ahead and do that if you like, or come back later and try it. Books can take you anywhere. Let's see what that looks like. Does your message look like this? 
That's how mine turned out. All right, now maybe you'd like to make up your own sentence. Why don't you try writing any message you want with that last set of words? And then ask somebody in your family to decode it. Here is the code again. You have that for reference. And go ahead and see what you can write. Now, it might be some kind of a silly sentence since you only have these 16 very specific words to use, but I bet you'll come up with something interesting. Are you ready? Did you do it? Now, now you know how to do it and what you can do with Legos that you might not have ever done before. So it's your chance in the weeks ahead to make up your own code. You can set up the board with a series of arrangements of um, particular Lego combinations and decide which words they're gonna stand for. And then you can write your own secret messages and maybe share your key with somebody else and send messages back and forth. I hope you'll have fun doing that. But I have another activity I'd like to show you, something else we can do with the bricks at home. And this is coding a Lego maze. And the materials for this activity can be found online um, at this address right here, researchparent.com. And so in this activity, we're gonna build a maze on a Lego base or bricks, brick base or any kind of smooth solid base and then write a code or a series of directions that will guide um, a little figure through the, the maze from the start to the finish. So when people write code for computers, it's important that they break down what they want the computer to do into many small steps, making sure they don't leave anything out and they give the directions in exactly the right order. Just like when we did the codes, we had to be very careful to arrange the Legos exactly the way that they were um, shown on the key. So when you're setting up a series of steps, you have to be sure that everything's in the right order and you haven't left anything out. And you have to think from the computer's perspective when you give it each command. So these are some of the things we're going to be practicing when we create our Lego maze. All right, so if you go to this site now or later when you have time, you'll find templates that are um, free to download and print out and use at home. Or you can actually just learn from this activity as you see it and make your own out of your own paper. For now, you can just watch me demonstrate how to create the maze and write a code. Or you, and you can pause the recording and download all the materials if you want to make your own as we go along. Are you ready? Okay, let's get started. So the first thing you're gonna do is you'll find when you download those materials that there are five or six different mazes to choose from. So choose a maze and cut it out. And then you can tape it to your Lego base or to any other, any kind of smooth surface that you could build on. And the second thing you want to cut out are a bunch of commands. And you'll find these also at that site. Pages of go forward command cards and some that say turn left, turn right, and some other more complicated commands that we can get to or you can work towards later. So when you've got all your materials together, now it's time to build. <laughs> this is the fun and creative part. So you can build walls all around the maze, however you like, get creative, go to town. You might wanna build some bridges or pillars or very high walls so the person walking through can't see anything. It's entirely up to you, have fun with that. And when you've got all your surrounding um, area filled in the way you want, then you're gonna find some kind of small figure that you can guide through your maze. Here's mine. Let's call this person Ellis. And I'm gonna put Ellis down on the start square. 
Now, because I've built walls up all around it, Ellis can't see how to get through the maze from start to end. So we're going to have to direct Ellis with our code. And remember, we're gonna to have to give a direction for every single step. And that means each step is one square. So where should we begin? What's the first direction Ellis is going to need? Here's Ellis, ready to go, waiting for our direction. All right, so we're gonna say, go forward. Should we just say it once? If we only say go forward once, Ellis will travel forward just one square. So how many forward commands do we need? Right, three. So let's add two more. Go forward, go forward, go forward. Great. I like to lay out the code on the floor next to my maze in a line. And you'll see it's going to keep going for quite a while. It's good to have it all where you can see it in order and lay it out straight. So let's see, where is Ellis now? There we go. Ellis has gotten to the end of that line and is facing a wall. What do we need to tell Ellis to do now? Which way do we want our person to turn? Do you think it's right? Well, let's put one of the turning cards in Ellis's hands. My figure has arms that go up so I can actually lay the card right in Ellis's arms. And it looks like the arrow's pointing the direction we want Ellis to go, right? So it looks like turn right is the correct command. But take a look at this. What if you came, came around to the other side the, the way Ellis is facing, and we laid the turn left card in Ellis's arms. Now the arrow is pointing in the direction that we think Ellis should go. So which one is right? Which one is correct? The turn left or the turn right? Well, remember that I said it's important to think in when you're doing coding from the computer's perspective, and in this case, we have to put ourselves in the shoes of our figure walking the maze. We have to be in the perspective of Ellis. So let's imagine we're standing there and not Ellis. We have to get into um, Ellis's position. So that would be the first picture where we're looking straight ahead of us and holding that card. And so the arrow that we need to follow is the one that says go right. So here's our code so far. Go forward, go forward, go forward, and then turn right. Got it? Okay, we're coming right along. So now the arrow's pointing where we want to go. And let's get Ellis turned. There's now they're turned and ready to move again. So what's the next direction we need to do? More go forwards, right? Let's see how many. One, two, three, four, five. You need five more go forward commands to bring Ellis down to the very bottom. And then we're facing a wall again, right? Time for another turn. Which way? Should we say turn right or turn left? Did you figure it out? Yep, we're looking at it from Ellis's perspective and this time we need to turn left. So add that command into your line of code. All right, great job. So here we are. What's the last bit? Can you write the last part of the code to get Ellis right there to the end square? Only four more commands. Go forward, go forward, go forward, 
go forward. Hooray, made it. There we go. All the way through. And here's the whole code that directs Ellis through the maze. Does yours look like that? All right. I hope you enjoyed watching that. And now, job well done. <laughs> we did it. Now, if you were writing out code at home like I was, you could leave it all there in a line and then have somebody from your family come and see if they can follow the code with the figure. And if it gets them to the end of the maze, you know you did it right. Somebody else was able to follow it and make it work. Or you can um, write out the code and then um, have them figure out how to get through it. So what's next? Do you want to increase your challenge? Or are you ready to take your maze and code to the next level? Well, computer programmers look, like to look for ways to make their codes as short and as simple as possible. If we look at the code we wrote, there's a lot of repetition. Let's see, there it is. So many go forwards all in a row, right? So programmers introduce something called loops that can shorten the repetition. And so they tell the computer how long they should do the same thing. And then they say, tell the computer to stop doing that same thing and move on to the next command. So if we were to try that with this code, we would take the three go forwards and shorten it to this, co this command for three steps, go forward, then end and turn right. After that, for five steps, go forward, end, and turn left. For four steps, go forward, and end. So that would be a little quicker. If you download all those materials from researchparent.com, you'll have all kinds of um, higher level commands like that that you can figure out how to incorporate once you're an expert with the simple form of code. But another thing you can do is cut out more mazes and try some different ones. So you can see this one has a lot more twists and turns. So it would take a lot more code to get your person from start to finish. And you could even make your own mazes, make them as twisty and long and complicated as you want, and then share them with some friends. Maybe you could each make them um, do a maze and then trade. I hope you'll have lots of fun this summer doing these code and maze activities with bricks. You can make your secret messages or mazes and share them with others. And if you're interested in more ideas about computer coding, there are lots of good books you can check out from the library. And you know now you can put them on hold and pick them up at your favorite branch without, um, any, without coming into the main part of the library. We have contactless pickup. And so you just request them. And then when you know the live, when your holds are in, you schedule an appointment to come pick up your books and you can borrow them for the three weeks just as before and, um, and renew them. So here are a few ideas of some books you might wanna try. Here are the biographies we talked about before, or maybe some great books about how to do coding. Getting started with coding, Python for kids, or maybe you'd like some um, this Secret Coders graphic novel series, which is really fun with both a story and coding activity sprinkled throughout. Thanks so much for joining me today. If you have any questions about this class, you can email HC, askhcls at hclibrary.org. And I hope you'll check out our website too to see what other great classes are posted online. Thanks again for being here. Talk to you, let's see you soon.